Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on what is our fourth ta Talking Town Planning webinar. Um, hopefully, you'll find today useful. Um, we focused in on quite a niche topic, actually. Can biodiversity and business prosper at the same time? Although, what I would say is clearly this is an issue that is going to crop up across many sites, both Greenfield and Brownfield, uh, large and small. Um, for today's webinar, I'm once again chairing. Uh, we have a brand new expert panel uh, comprising Dave West and Vivian Greenow from our WYG Southampton and Guildford ecology teams, respectfully. And Ross Bowen joins us from our Cardiff planning team as well. So welcome to everyone there. I'm just very aware there's been a lot of announcements uh, planning wise recently and things are very moving at a very fast pace in the planning world. Um, Ross, did you want to pick up on that just to start with, just to give us a bit of a general uh, planning roundup, particularly in light of recent government's announcements, even even as late as sort of yesterday? Yeah, sure. Um, afternoon, everybody. It was nothing much to report, apparently, other than the, the most radical planning reform since the Second World War. So uh, I'm sure it, me and everybody else has been uh, been looking through the detail as much as we can. Uh, we can find that. Obviously, during the Prime Minister's um, build, build, build address yesterday, um, a number of announcements were made. Um, to touch on them very, very briefly, I think otherwise we'll... Um, We'll not get round to the subject we're here to discuss, and, and I wouldn't want to steal material from colleagues for no doubt future uh, future talking town planning. But um, in essence, we're promised a planning policy paper from the government uh, in July, and this promises the most comprehensive reform of the planning system um, in 70 years. Now, I'm sure we've, we're all more than familiar with uh, reviews of the planning system. There's been numerous ones of those quite whether this is a, a genuine reform, um, a fundamental shift remains to be seen and we'll obviously await the detail in July with, with interest. Um, who knows what it may be? I mean, there's some speculation that it could be a real shift towards a, a zonal form of planning, um, you know, a, a genuinely radical um, uh, change. Um, we'll, we'll obviously just have to see. There are some very short-term measures that have been put in place, um, just to update uh, us on our COVID-related, uh, as, you, as you said, Rebecca. Um, uh, last week, we had the automatic extension of planning permissions in England that were due to lapse uh, between the start of COVID in March this year and the end of the year, uh, automatic extensions to April 2021. Um, this week, we've had uh, approval of uh, new temporary pavement licences um, to, to help cafes and restaurants um, with a streamlined seven-day uh, approval process, uh, potentially granting consents up to September 2021. Um, and a couple of uh, re-announcements yesterday, um, as ever, often these things we've heard before, um, an extension of permitted development rights, again, to enable empty commercial properties uh, to be repurposed um, for, for other commercial uses and residential offices, and an extension of permitted development rights for householders to extend properties upwards. Um, so that's, in short, um, I think, uh, as much detail as we probably want to go into. And obviously, if anybody does have questions and queries, I'm sure if they email the talking town planning address, we'll, we'll follow those up. But uh, in essence, that's that's what I would summarise as the, as, the, as the headlines of where we are. So it's quite, quite a busy week. Yeah, we definitely could spend another hour, I suspect, uh, talking on those, and, and perhaps at some stage you will. Um, in our Wellington office, we've been working on quite a number of... Um, SIL deferrals as well, where the government's um, uh, done a mirror, uh, uh, published a ministerial statement, just basically saying, you know, where there's grounds for it, please, please let developers, make, you know, defer those payments for sort of three, six months at a time, um, you know, particularly where they've commenced development already. So that's another one to to watch out for as well. It's not actually been uh, legislated for, but they are planning to. Um, so, turning to our topic of the day, I think um, it's fair to say, certainly for me, I'm sure for a lot of other people, biodiversity net gain is a very new concept to all of us. I don't think it's actually been enacted yet, but um, we're very much looking at it uh, on the horizon and certainly we're getting requests from 
planning, uh, local planning authorities to look at it as well. Um, it seems useful at this early stage just to pass over to David first uh, before any of the questions. Um, just to talk us through, Dave, the principles of biodiversity net gain. Um, what's it all about? What's changed? And importantly, how is biodiversity net gain affecting ours and our clients' business? Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so just briefly, um, the, the idea of um, biodiversity net gain, as, as the name suggests, kind of the core principle is that uh, development should leave biodiversity in a, in a better state post-development than, than when it's been found. Um, uh, and basically what that means is it's, it's a bit of a shift in the way we deal with biodiversity um, through planning in that we're looking at all the impacts of, of development and, and then mitigating and, and indeed providing gains following those impacts rather than just looking at significant impacts, which is what that's effectively what our uh, methodologies have been based on up until now. Um, part of the reason for that is to try and address a, a large scale loss of biodiversity, which has been occurring over the years in the UK, um, whereas previously a development on a fairly ecologically poor greenfield site might not have provided any any new habitat creation. Um, it, it might not be a significant impact, but it still contributes to an overall loss of biodiversity. So that's one of the things that, that Biodiversity Net Gain is hoping to address. Um, and the other thing um, to kind of help with that is it's introducing this metric based approach to actually quantifying impacts on biodiversity, um, which is a very kind of large shift and it's kind of been driven by the um, DEFRA's previous biodiversity offsetting uh, metric. Um, and that, that's quite useful in a way because it allows us to be a lot more precise about um, about impacts and then quantifying the amount of habitat creation and measures that are required in order to achieve biodiversity net gain. And hopefully it will lead to a lot more consistency, um, certainly won't initially, but in the long term, more consistency about how this is dealt with across different local authorities. So I'm right in thinking that you, you've essentially, rather than just the the previous, you know, protect and enhance through through planning policies that you that you have to meet, you now have a a scorecard, um, and you have to you have to pass the test, so so to speak. Yeah, effectively the, the and, and this change was kind of in the it was in the offing from the update to the MPPF because the previous MPPF required no. It was basically around no net loss of biodiversity, whereas now it now it asks for for a net gain, um, and and the number that's been bandied around, which is going to be kind of mandated by the environment bill, is a ten percent uh, gain in biodiversity, which is which is what we're going to be looking at. So just um, turning to get Viv's thoughts on this, actually, uh, so the difference. I mean, that's that's the obvious question, isn't it? What's the difference between biodiversity, net gain and offsetting. We've had a, a few questions that I've, I've kind of bundled into one really on, on, on that, but, but around the same theme. Is it is it the numbers that's that's changed or or is it the whole approach? So I think I got what is the difference between offsetting and the net gain approach? Um, the simple answer is that there is no difference. So offsetting is just part of the whole um, biodiversity net gain process. So Ideally, within your development site, um, you want to try and achieve your net gain with, within with, within your site, within your red line boundary. However, in certain scenarios, that won't be possible. So then you're then looking to compensate for or make up your net gain off site, uh, whether that be in adjacent um, habitat or somewhere further afield in, in, in the local area. But really offsetting, it's all part of the same process. Offsetting is, is part of the net gain process. And it's, it, yeah, it's something that's been misunderstood in um, the previous months gone by, but it, it, it is the same, it is the same approach in effect. Thanks Viv. And just turning back to Dave for a second, um, we have had a question in on when will biodiversity net gain actually become mandatory, which is a pretty important one to put at the front? Yeah, so I suppose the first thing to say is that um, although the big headline 10% figure is not yet mandatory, um, net gain is a requirement of the MPPF, um, although it has the slight caveat, as it always does, of, of being kind of where possible. But there are a large number of local authorities that already have policies in place requiring biodiversity net gain even before it's been kind of 
um, brought through by the government. So there are places where it is already a requirement. Uh, at Dorset, for an example, down where we are, they have a, uh, a specific kind of process for doing um, kind of biodiversity mitigation enhancement plans, which require you to demonstrate a net gain as part of that process. Um, the main mandatory 10% net gain is going to be introduced as part of the Environment Bill. Um, currently, we're expecting that that's likely to be signed towards the end of this year. Obviously, it's been impacted by by COVID, as, as a lot of other things have, but um, it passed its first reading in the previous government with kind of no amendments or objections. It's very been, it's been widely supported by all parties, and it's it's been reintroduced, and, and I think it's already had its its first reading the second time round. So that's the kind of time frame that we're looking at. Um, I'd be very surprised if it's if it's not in place probably by early next year. Yeah, certainly. I think. Um, I mean, I've I've got proposals just you know sort of at the pre-app stage at the moment, just for a single house um, in Somerset Western Taunton's area, and and we're already looking at that as part of the ecology work. Uh, Ross, I'll just bring you in here. Um, what's been your sort of experience to date? Is this something that you're looking at with with clients sort of through the pre-app process, or is it even impacting on your um, pending planning applications at the moment? It it's beginning to um, certainly. When we're we're looking at sites now, I think we're um, councils. Even if they they haven't um, formal policies in place, it's certainly on the agenda. And the general principle of of seeking a net gain is is certainly there. Uh, with some of the schemes I'm working on, even if it's not um, uh, mandatory, sort of the 10% requirement, or or even sort of the the detailed sort of um, uh, metrics. Uh, calculation. It, it, so it's certainly the principles there, and, and you know it's it's on everyone's radar now. So um, uh, e even on those projects where it's perhaps a, a long way down the line, potentially on larger projects, I think something we're going to be saying over and over again today is get get involved early, early engagement, get the ecologists in as soon as possible on on, on particularly on large scale proposals. Um, it's going to be it's going to be critical because. Um, this potentially is um, is one of the, the the next battlegrounds for viability, really, after affordable housing. So, no one quite knows what, how it's all going to play out yet. But um, yeah, it, it's it's on it's on the radar of authorities, on developers, uh, on our radars, and, and we're obviously all feeling our way into it a bit. But yeah, certainly it's a a, a very real and growing uh, uh, requirement. So. Yeah, I, I always thought the next battleground after after affordable housing was SIL, and it can't be as bad as that. Surely, surely not. Um, just turning actually back to the sort of the the mandatory requirements and the timescales, and that Julie has asked a really good question on our Teams chat facility. Um, I said just just press that speech bubble uh, um, icon on our. Um, on your menu there if you haven't found it yet um, and I'll throw this out to Dave if I can uh, will there be a transitional period once the bill receives royal assent yeah that's a, that's a good question um, the, the the short answer is uh, we don't know I'm afraid um, the intention certainly from the government consultation on biodiversity net gain is that there will be um, and I think it's probably reasonable to expect that there will be a transition um, originally they talked about a two-year period um, the grey area is that, that no one's yet seen any details as to what that transitional period would actually cover and how it would be implemented. As, as I mentioned, there's, there's areas of the country where biodiversity again is already required, so clearly a transitional period wouldn't necessarily apply there. It might be, and, and certainly from the comments that were received back on the consultation, the main crux of the, of the transitional period was to try and protect things like allocations um, and sites which we received outline consent where master plans and things have been devised without taking into account biodiversity net gain and then would kind of unreasonably need significant changes in order to meet the requirements. Um, just a quick point on, I suppose, the, the, the actual technical aspects of implementation, the way that, that the requirement will be mandated is through um, a new schedule in the Town and Country Planning Act that's going to effectively add a new condition on all permissions, which uh, requires the submission of a strategy to be approved by a local planning authority that demonstrates how that 10% percent 
requirement will be met. So at the moment, it's not clear how, if that's the process for, for mandating it, how a transitional period would actually work, and, and, unless it was that that amendment isn't made initially. Um, there's also been talk about whether or not the transitional period would only apply to some types of development, for example, brownfield sites. Um, so there's still kind of, it's still kind of wait and see to a certain extent on that. I mean, we have had the question um, in terms of, you know, what happens if biodiversity net gain comes in just after submitting your planning application? Now, what, from what we've just been discussing, I mean, clearly, hopefully everybody's thinking about it now or will be thinking about it now, so that once we're in a situation where it is mandated, it doesn't come as a, as a big surprise. But I suppose with you saying, Dave, that, you know, uh, and Ross as well, that we've been... Uh, local authorities have already been sort of mooting this and asking for this and, and, and you know, looking looking at the MPPF requirements to date. I mean, you know, currently at the moment, if you have a planning application in and this is sprung on you, um, so to speak, what is what is what is the best approach to, to take at the moment? Um, can I throw that question out to Viv, if that's OK? So we're hoping, obviously, that we will get a more confirmed timescale um, as to when net gain will come in and be mandated. Um, if um, the best advice I, you know, I can I can give is that if you know that net gain is going to be made compulsory, you know, within the next three months, and that coincides with the submission of your planning application, then really just to de-risk your application, you, you should do a net gain assessment when you submit, and then in that eventuality, um, if it hasn't quite come in yet, but it will, it, it is imminent then you know you've supplied all the required information that you have there. Um, I think it would be quite unlikely for, um, uh, you know, a plan application to be submitted and then it really to be, you know, by just, you know, for net gain, for the net gain requirement to be completely, you know, not heard of. Um, but yeah, best thing is to just keep keep consulting with your LPA, um, keep asking the question as to, um, you know, what they require. I mean, we already have a really good idea um, throughout the UK about which local planning authorities are already asking for net gain assessments. And, and we're starting to see more and more LPAs sort of added to that list. And uh, we're, we're keeping a track. Um, our, GI, our GIS team are uh, making a map of the UK, showing what local authorities already are asking, which ones sometimes do, sometimes don't, depending on the type of development. So yeah, obviously seek advice from your ecologist and um, consult with your LPA to try and avoid a unexpected uh, net gain requirement being sprung on you. Yeah, it's absolutely. That's really interesting about the GIS team's work as well. Um, and I, I suppose if you've got a, an application in already, it's just a case of, of of getting that process done, sort of sort of ASAP. Depending, I suppose, on the local authorities' policies and how much weight they have, um, because they can only really work off of their um, adopted adopted policies at this stage. Um, I had this is actually a question for me, to be fair, but I I had heard rumours. Uh, groans, I think, from the other side of the office, that there is more than one calculator um, out and available at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Dave on that one, actually. Um, Dave, is there a particular metric calculator to use, or is it just, uh, God forbid, uh, whichever local authority you happen to get? <clears throat> yeah, well, you're right, there are a few. Um, there's two main ones, I would say. That there's the the one that's been developed by Warwickshire, Coventry, and Solihull Council, who were really the main pilot scheme for biodiversity net gain. Um, but there's a number of other ones, for example, the Environment Bank, Thames Valley Environmental Record Centre, other examples. Um, however, we expect that once biodiversity net gain becomes mandatory, that the the standard metric to use will be the DEFRA. 2.0 metric, which was released probably almost a year ago now, um, which is still kind of receiving updates. But I think unless you're in an area, for example, Warwickshire, where they do have their own system, I think authorities would expect that, that that's the metric to use. Um, certainly most of the time, although I will say we've got at least one project where we've ended up being asked to use three or four different metrics, um, where we've had uh, local authority ecologists absolutely sure that we can demonstrate net gain and we've had to use kind of yeah three or four different metrics to prove them wrong 
so very much work in progress i think is what we can what we can potentially establish from that it's normally more painful at the start isn't it um we've had two questions on our team chats which are kind of interlinked um we've talked a lot about the legislation and and the process and the principles and these are quite useful questions in terms of getting down to i suppose the nitty-gritty and and what this physically means for development sites so uh, first of all, from from uh, Nick and Arsenal Hampton team, what kinds of enhancements and measures can generally count towards achieving net gain points? And likewise, uh, Jonathan Morris has asked, do you have an example of the additional inputs that that, that have become necessary to demonstrate the 10% gain for a development site? And obviously, it will vary across. So to summarise those, what are we actually looking at in terms of, you know, are we talking about an extra, you, you know, having 50% of your developable area as woodland, or are we talking about offsite contributions, or, or you know, how how is that looking in terms of what's being delivered on site? Ross, you mentioned that um, you had had some very early dealings with with these type of sites pre um, recently. Sorry, um, is there any examples that you can give in terms of what you what you've been doing on your sites? Well, I think I think it's just worth emphasising that the, the way that local authorities want this approached is that first of all, it's mitigation and enhancement on site. Um, so it's uh, it, it, what can you actually do within the within the development site itself, um, you know, and, and possibly then securing uh, uh, some compensatory habitat, and then off then potentially if you can't do that, then then off site habitat creation. The, the schemes I've worked on to date, it's really been in terms of um, in mitigation and enhancement on site. As I say, I don't think it's uh, the, the examples uh, I've worked on could be described as being, um, you know, a, a hugely robust application of uh, biodiversity net gain. Uh, but but what they've looked to do is certainly to to gain some improvements in areas such as um, uh, combining. Uh, uh, sustainable drainage, uh, open space, uh, and habitat creation, and I think this is something certainly we we can we may well come on to um, to think about is how uh, we can approach sites a bit more creatively than we have in the past to think how certain um, areas can can work together, such as drainage, uh, habitat creation, um, open space, to not necessarily see the uh, biodiversity net gain as something that's going to, you know, eat up, uh, you know, land to reduce development site area. It, so the ones I've been involved with, it's really on-site sort of enhancement, really, uh, and I, and that's, as I say, in terms of the, the process that should be followed. That's that's the top priority um, is to see what could be that actually on-site or or just mitigation at, at source. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Um... The example that I I just um, was talking about, actually just just the one house, um, potentially could have been quite problematic. Except that my client just happens to own land all around the development site as well, so that was quite useful in terms of providing space. Um, and I believe we will be providing. There's a few options. Um, we can protect and enhance uh, some nearby ponds that he owns. We can uh, effectively make either our red line or blue line bigger. Um, to provide habitat just just to the south of the site. I suppose the point I'm making is that it, it and it's good that we're looking at it early on to make sure that our site boundaries will be correct, that we're in control of the land that we need to be in control of. Um, it would be a very different, well, not not in necessarily in that case, but because he does own all the land, but you know it could be a very different process if you've already got a planning application in and you have to whole heart. Either, either wholeheartedly change things or just be amending boundaries and areas of land to incorporate measures for biodiversity enhancement. Um, I mean, going back to you, Dave, what's what's been your experience on your sites? Has it has it fundamentally changed what you've been what you've been securing in terms of biodiversity enhancement measures, um, or is it much more of a subtle subtlety? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's fundamental change, but there are some there are some interesting things to bear in mind. I mean, well, the first thing is that um, probably the biggest impact on 
your biodiversity net gain requirement is the impacts. So it really does, re this metric based approach really does reinforce the need to avoid impacts where possible. Um, it's considerably harder to achieve your net gain if you lose an area of high distinctiveness woodland, for example, than if your development is restricted to losing low quality immunity grassland. So it, it has a big impact on master planning. Um, on the other side, there are opportunities there where you've got sites that include habitats of high distinctiveness. There's, there's easy wins where you've got woodland in poor condition. You can score a lot of points if you if you put together enhancement proposals to bring that back up to, to good condition. Um, the, the less kind of metric based approaches are things with biodiversity net gain. Um, they, it does encourage your kind of habitat creation to try and meet local conservation objectives. So it's not necessarily just a case of creating woodland everywhere. We've had conversations with Oxfordshire Council, for example, who don't really want to see a lot of woodland creation because there's already quite good woodland coverage in the county and it's just not an objective for them. Similarly, we've been push we've had sites where we've been pushed back on in South Downs, for example, where again, they don't want to see a lot of woodland planted because that's not the character of the area. Um, the other thing just to bear in mind is that, that when we talk about habitat creation, when we fill out the metric, we have to allow for certain risk factors like the difficulty of achieving the condition we're aiming for and the time as well. So although woodland in and itself scores quite well in the metric, once you take into account the fact that it's going to take 35, 40, 50 years for it to actually provide the biodiversity gains that we're looking for, it actually scores quite poorly in terms of the number of biodiversity units per hectare. So it's not always the, the, the kind of the best approach. So um, it does require a bit more thought now as to what's appropriate for the site and what's the best way to actually get the gains you need than, than maybe we might have taken before where, where you just kind of do the standard, here's a wildflower meadow, that's a, that's a nice gain, let's plant an area of woodland. Um, it does kind of focus things a bit more now. Yes, it seems really about getting in there. I feel like we might say this a few times today, but getting in there very, very early looking at it as a constraints and opportunities um, exercise rather than kind of as an add-on within an ecology assessment, you know, once you've got your layout fixed and, and that and that kind of thing. That, that's what it sort of feels like. I don't know if you agree with that, Viv, or want to add anything to that at all? Uh, absolutely. I think early engagement is key here. Uh, I think one of the common mistakes that we're still finding is, um, uh, you know, the ecologist is appointed um, at a fairly late stage when there's already a fairly set design or scheme layout in place, which has been designed around maybe some other, you know, issues or constraints within the site. And um, at that stage, um, it's quite tricky uh, for the ecologist because obviously there's not that much um, uh, scope to like you know move things around um, one of the easiest things to do to achieve your net gain is to retain your most val valuable habitats on site so if you get your survey done early and you know that you know that that area of grass and is particularly diverse, it scores quite highly in condition if you retain and protect that within your scheme layout then that's that's going going a long way for you already achieving your net gain um, so yeah it's a, a theme already discussion but yeah nothing further to add than yeah get, get an ecologist involved as soon as you can really absolutely i think it sounds like we're all on all on the same same page here um we have got a question in from julie on our team chats um is it known yet if there will be any development which is exempt from biodiversity net gain um i'll send that one back to viv again um if that's if that's all right that consultation which happened last year did make some reference to some types of development being exempt from net gain. Um, the truth is we do not know what the exemptions will be. We just need to wait and see um, when we get some further clarification and when the bill has been ratified. But some will be exempt, but for the majority of the sites that we all work on on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it will be mandatory. Yeah. Absolutely. We've had a really interesting question on our emails actually about, um, well, two really interesting ones. I'll, I'll fire the first the first one off, which is if you've secured outline consent before the requirements come in and then you go in for a reserve matters 
application um, after the requirements come in, would there then be an argument to say that you know you, you don't you don't have to then look at the biodiversity net gain as part of the reserve matters? Um, Dave, can I throw that one to you? Uh, yeah, again, it's 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 hard to be absolutely sure without seeing the kind of final wording um, of, of the bill. But my, the hope would be that you wouldn't have to do it in that case. I mean, we have a couple of examples, uh, Viv and I, where we've worked on existing um, existing developments that have got outline consent, and then local authorities have come back and asked for biodiversity net gain at the reserve matter stage, and we've been able to make the argument to say that look, it's not a material consideration um, for, for the outline consent, therefore it's not something that they can go back and subsequently ask for. Um, so I suspect that it wouldn't be required in that case, and it might be that that's one of the reasons why the, the transitional period will, will come into play. Yeah, and my understanding, um, from talking to you, Dave, actually, is that the biodiversity net gain will come through planning conditions um, in terms of securing a scheme uh, for biodiversity net gain. So I suppose if it's not on the outline, then you wouldn't expect such a condition to be on the reserve map. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, the only thing just to add on that in, in terms of the, the condition is it's 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 not the ideal way, way of actually dealing with this. Um, it's it's actually no good leaving it to the condi to discharge condition stage because um, it's really critical as we've, as we've talked around a few times. It's really critical that this is taken into account at the master planning and, and layout stage. Really, it's no good kind of designing a scheme and getting a consent and then having to put together a, a package to discharge conditions when it's not actually practical um, unless you're going to rely on a huge amount of offsite kind of uh, contributions. Yeah, absolutely. The the second question was in relation to, you know, we assume that this will be a requirement for outline planning uh, applications moving forward. I just wondered, Ross, if you had any thoughts on, on on how you, you know, when you've got a development where the appearance, layout, scale, landscaping may be subject to future reserve matters applications, um, how you'd look to put the evidence in to show that you are dealing with biodiversity net gain uh, and also any mechanisms to sort of secure it within the consent. Yeah, well, just to touch upon what, what's been said previously, I mean, I certainly would be arguing as a planning consultant, I think the principal stage is, is the outline. And I think once once we've gone past that, I would certainly be arguing it's, uh, it's too late in the day, really, to be uh, seeking to claw back um, uh, you know, ground on, on on matters such as that, as we would with other points of principle uh, for for outline um, outline planning consent. So, um, yeah, I guess it remains to be seen how exactly it pans out uh, for, uh, in, in relation to to reserve matters. I mean, some of the principles, I'm sure we, you know, um, as we should be doing anyway, we we'll probably try and improve our schemes and our applications as we go through as much as we can. But obviously, you know, if it if it bites on the viability points, then that's that's really where uh, certainly a lot of my clients are concerned about, and how the authorities will weigh up those uh, competing interests as they have to do at the moment. Um, in terms of there's only so much money to uh, support schemes, and you know, one point is uh, remains to be seen is really where does biodiversity net gain stand in the um, uh, the, the the order of the wish list of local authorities when things do have to drop out. Um, there is something else I'd just like to to, to throw in actually on, on whilst this is all focused on um, development management stage, it will be interesting to see how biodiversity net gain sort of starts coming into plan making as well and whether um, allocations uh, you know are required to. To eat before they even get um, past the first post, really, uh, can they show a realistic prospect of being able to achieve um, a 10 percent net gain? In, you know, as, as David has been said on the master planning approach. So, uh, I do think that's something to watch out for as well as to how this uh, how this will affect um, um, the plan preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Because there is talk a lot of. Um you know, very recently emerging and adopted local plans are talking about um, 
um, carbon reduction and achieving net zero by sort of 2030 and that sort of thing. They're actually talking about allocating sites for woodland and this kind of stuff. You could see, you know, to reduce their the effects of of carbon through new new development as a more of a strategic um, way of doing it rather than through on site measures. You could see something similar happening with biodiversity net gain in terms of you know local authorities. It may make absolute sense to. Um, you know, put development in places where there is a big impact on biodiversity, but then they ha they have the challenge then of perhaps having to deliver something off site, um, not dissimilar to how they've kind of used buffer zones and areas to um, where where developers pay in, um, off site contributions. Um, you know, for recreational impacts uh, on the triple SIs and the SACs and 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 that kind of thing as well. Um, but Funny fantastic shit. question. Go on, just, sorry, just, just to check, check in there, Rick, it's funny you should mention that. Um, I mean, we're currently actually working on a project where we've been asked to provide a strategy for delivering um, a minimum 10% net gain for a strategic allocation in the Horsham District Local Plan. And um, certainly having reviewed kind of initial comments from consultees on their, their potential strategic allocations, one thing that has come up on every allocation has been the, the lack of demonstration of how they'll achieve diversity net gain. So it is something that will be picked up at the plan level. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, they, and as we all know, those things uh, do not happen quickly, do they, uh, in terms of devising a, a, a strategy um, to deal with things like that. Um, we've got a great question from David Davies. Um, currently, there is nothing to stop a developer removing biodiversity in advance of making an application, i.e. Uh, tree removal. Will the new Act address this? Could a developer in advance of a 10% uh, requirement just remove as much biodiversity on site as possible? Um, now, we know this never happens, obviously. However, hypothetically, if it did, I'm going to go to the planner first. I feel like that's a good way to go. And then perhaps we'll hear from Viv and Dave. Yes, well, obviously, we would hope, hope that that wouldn't happen. Um, there has been a point in my uh, in my career where something similar did happen quite accidentally, and my client, who shall remain nameless, um, had had no idea that uh, a rather uh, overzealous uh, contractor proceeded to remove most of the, the trees from a particular site. What we were uh, landed with was a condition for the local authority requiring extensive replanting um, to to uh, quite an, a, a substantial cost. So um, I would be uh, I wouldn't put that past an authority, perhaps quite reasonably, to to try and to try and do that. So it certainly would not be an approach that would be advisable, um, and I think would very much start things on the wrong footing with a local authority you know to, to work positively on this one i think you if that action's taken it re, you're in for a hard ride on, on on all sorts of things so the planner says no <laughs> yes and certainly from a i think from a commercial angle as well you know if you take out all of your constraints well to a certain extent that's great isn't it but you also, and to be fair, you know, if we're not talking about TPO trees and that kind of thing, then technically, no, there isn't anything stopping you doing that. But of course, by taking out your constraints, you may very well take out your opportunities on site. So if the idea is that you're protecting and improving things that are important, as long as you can work with those constraints, you then get the opportunities that come with us as well, which may well increase your developable lands on other areas of the site. Again, um, I, I, at the risk of repeating myself, I think it is very much getting in there at an early stage and mapping out your constraints and opportunities so that you've got a proper site-specific strategy. Um, yes, of course, that that is then more risk, isn't it, at the early stages, which no one likes. You have to get consultants on board. You have to do work at risk ahead of a planning application. Um, but of course, then it does hopefully provide you with more certainty uh, down the line. And I always say to my clients, you might spend longer at the pre-app, but inevitably you'll spend less time during the planning application, you know, if we've done our jobs properly. Yeah, um, uh, one of the questions sort of talking about um, constraints and opportunities, how can biodiversity net gain be achieved whilst factoring in all other aspects of a site, um, for example, SUDS and public open space? It does very much feel like the list is growing and not reducing at any point. 
um, you know, this is going to have an impact on land values. Perhaps the, that's the idea. Who knows? Uh, in a very simple world. Um, but, but you know, I said the question, how can biodiversity net gain be achieved whilst factoring in all other all other requirements of a site? Um, I'll throw that out to Viv, please. Sure. So, um, so actually, if you have a sub scheme on your site, that can work quite well with achieving net gain. Um, the key is to just collaborate um, with all your fellow disciplines and to work together to achieve, you know, um, what you both require. But for sub schemes, so wetland habitats actually score quite highly in the calculator. Um, so there is opportunity there to um, get some, you know, um, some real good, uh, good number of credits. Um, you have, there's an element of um, you have to be a little bit careful because uh, the ecologist would really need to understand um, what, you know, the sub scheme. So what each pool of water, what it was achieving, because obviously some suds are designed, uh, you know, are designed to be dry for most of for most of the year, whereas others are designed to, you know, be full of water. And obviously the ones with water would score higher than, than a dry sud is. But key is just um, making sure the ecologist does understand um, the sub scheme. So they can take what you put in changes what comes out at the other end. Um, so um, that yeah, subs work quite well um, with, with public open space. Um, that that too can work really well. Um, things like community orchards, or if you've got a community beehive, beekeeping, or even just open space where people want to you know um, um, for recreation or dog walking. Again, these areas may score lower um, because obviously if you've got dog walkers um, the habitat isn't going to be score as high in quality but that said it will still contribute um, to, to, to your net gain credit. Um, I mean the other final thing to mention as well is um, a European protected species so that's your great crested newt, um, a bat species or perhaps dormice. Um, part of the requirement you know to to achieve your planning consent will be that you retain that population in favourable conservation status and that, and that you retain those habitats which are important for those species. So this ties in quite well with net gain because if you're keeping habitat for great crested newt and dormice either adjacent or on your site then it's likely that you can score quite highly um, with credits going forward and you'd have to keep it anyway regardless of whether or not you'd be doing net gain um, to satisfy you know European legislation and um, also our planning policy in the UK. Okay, um, so it is achievable. Um, so for, for your larger sites, I would say it's easier to achieve, but that said, it is achievable for smaller sites as well. Um, it just takes a bit of collaborating. And again, I'm going to go back to the common theme today, early, early stage, early onset. Thanks, Viv. And actually, your comments tie nicely with our next question, which is a nice, a nice simple one, which I like. Um, uh, my site is small uh, and constrained. How do I achieve net gain? Um, Dave, your thoughts? Well, kind of as, as Viv said, the, the, the first thing is to try and um, achieve as much as possible with um, with kind of multifunctional spaces. Um, ultimately, there are there will be sites where it's just it's just not possible, particularly uh, infill sites, um, kind of those, those small schemes where you might be losing one dwelling and, and, and sticking four in place of them. And those sites are effectively going to rely on contributions to off-site measures. Um, in the short term, it's going to be tricky because apart from a few examples like Warwickshire, for example, where I think it's safe to say costs are horrendously kind of overpriced, uh, there aren't many systems that you can easily pay into yet. Um, the way the government expect this to work is that local authorities will develop each develop their schemes, um, identifying areas where they want to do kind of biodiversity and habitat creation, and then there'll be a, a effectively a credit payment system um, where you can purchase the one or two credits that you need in order to get your scheme over the line. Um, and partly that's that's meeting the main objectives of biodiversity net gain because one of the other things is that it's trying to achieve things on a on a larger scale and, and trying to move away from having kind of small pockets of habitat where they're potentially not really achieving very much or 
they might be achieving some benefits for, for amenity and wellness and things like that, but not really achieving much for biodiversity as a whole. So it's about trying to focus efforts in the right places. Um, so for those kind of really constrained sites, I think that that's the way things will work in the longer term. In the short term, we might see, as we've already had inquiries, uh, some agents and landowners, for example, um, undertaking their own um, habitat creation schemes in order to provide um, biodiversity credits for, for developers to buy up. Um, and potentially also a some kind of credit to training trading scheme. I mean, the government expectation was that this would effectively generate its own economy um, in biodiversity credits in, in the long term. Um, as with most of these things, same thing with affordable housing and so on. The, the, the pain is going to be in the short term um, where there's inconsistencies in the approach. I think in three or four years, hopefully once this becomes more standardised, then, then it won't be as much of a challenge. Yeah, it, it very much feels like it is a new process that, as with all new, new processes, there will be some teething issues and some inconsistencies um, until it sort of becomes um, fairly fairly mainstream. Um, just to pick up on the comments in the team's chats, thank you everyone for all of your, all of your comments today. It's really great. As I said, I, 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 my personal view is that the team chats is one of the most important elements because uh, it should be a group conversation really rather than rather than just us talking at you um, uh, Nigel has uh, quite rightly uh, picked up uh, I believe there are licensing constraints on tree removals outside of planning considerations Nigel yeah you're absolutely right clearly you need to be thinking about protected species um, and ensuring that all of those requirements are there and and ultimately you know as we've said before in this uh, planning th for things early not just viewing your biodiversity uh, as a constraint, but also as an opportunity as well. So definitely agree with that. Um, Bruno Moore has uh, asked a very good question, actually. Um, not sure who have the answer or not, but let's let's give it a shot. Um, the Environment Bill uses the same definition of development as the Town and Country Planning Act. Does this mean that biodiversity net gain will relate to everything that requires planning permission? For example, shop fronts. What a good question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that to Dave if that's okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I I think this is where we will expect to see some of the exemptions come into play. So, um, this type of application, householder applications, that kind of thing. Although, as I said before, it's tricky because we haven't seen that full list as to what will be um, included. But hopefully, there will be kind of some of the obvious things um like like that example there shop fronts will be on that list of, of things which aren't required to to demonstrate biodiversity net gain the other thing is we expect that there will be a some kind of simplified system as well um not to, to deviate too much but i was involved with some of the guidance for for briam 2018 and one of the things that was introduced there was was effectively a t two different um pathways for, for sites where you've got negligible impacts to make it much easier and cheaper to, to calculate your gains as opposed to sites where you do need like detailed input from an ecologist and the expectation is that there would be a um a, a similar approach to net gain so for yeah single dwelling applications there might be a simplified process household applications that kind of thing and um I'm conscious we're running out of time. Just, I don't want to do your job for you, Rebecca, but I've just seen um, seen Sarah's question there: removal of invasive non-native species. Uh, yeah, that that's that's the kind of thing that would help contribute to a net gain. Yeah, particularly if we if it can be done in areas of retained habitat, so where you've got maybe an on-site woodland that's full of Japanese knotweed. Absolutely, taking that out would 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 contribute to a, to a gain. I reckon we can squeeze one more in just about the process. Um, someone's asked a question. How long does biodiversity net gain take? Um, what is the process? Does it go in with your ecology appraisal, or is it a, a separate, a separate process? Yeah, I think what what this what this um, trying to get at there is is um, one of the main things we need to do is called a condition assessment. So normally with the phase one habitat survey, you would just be identifying the habitats that are, that are present on site. The extra step that we need to undertake for biodiversity net gain is actually assess whether those are in poor, moderate or good condition, because that then goes into determining what, what value those have in terms of biodiversity units. So 
our recommendation, certainly now that this is becoming a requirement for a lot of authorities, is to try and do that in one hit, try, try to avoid the, the cost of carrying out additional site visits when we can get all that information in one go. Um, the metric kind of side of it itself, the additional piece of work, um, it, it's probably comparable in time to an ecological appraisal. It, it, there is quite a lot of work that goes into the interpretation and the justifications. Um, and, and the biggest issue we've, we've come across for doing net gains is incremental changes to layouts and things like that, because any changes, whether it's to your proposed landscaping or even changes in plot layouts and things like that, impact on the the, figure, the numbers that are going into the metric and require everything to be rerun. So the best way we found to do it is to be doing a fairly high level assessment at the early stages of a project so that you can be you can have some reassurance that that you're going to be able to achieve that net, that level of net gain and then to do a final assessment once you've got a, a design freeze so that we avoid having to do kind of too many different iterations uh, and, and avoid all those abortive costs thanks dave and um, first of all thank you to everyone for coming along and spending the time today to coming back to our sort of original question can biodiversity and business prosper at the same time um, I'm going to summarise our discussions with a yes, um, although I'm going to say once again, it sounds to me like it needs very early planning, it needs to be done as part of the opportunities and constraints planning, as well as even at the, the you know, the site, uh, agreeing the site option stage as well, to make sure that you have um, the land to be able to do it and really to capitalise on any opportunities that are, are going to score you those credits. It seems like as with every new process that's brought in, there is some work to do with local authorities and with government to establish precedent um, and establish a, a methodology and hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, one calculator because that would be very helpful for everyone. Um, as I said at the start, this um, this session has been recorded. Uh, we intend to share it via LinkedIn and please ask for any copies that you might want uh, from talkingtownplanning at wig.com or pick it up on one of our LinkedIn accounts. Um, as always, we would like to do further sessions um, and it's really helpful if anybody has any suggestions on future topics or future formats. Um, stick it on the Teams Messenger if the idea crops up to you right now or, or post it on, linked, on one of our LinkedIn accounts or of course use our Talking Town Planning email address. Um, as always, you know, part of the reason for these sessions is, is so that we're, we're still communicating with our clients. WYG is very much open for business. Um, and we're looking at obviously everything that's going on with COVID, but I think what we're also trying to do as well is look to the future um, and what that's going to look like um, and making sure that we're taking a proactive approach. So hopefully that's really helpful to everybody um, now and quite convenient actually through a webinar. Um, when the technology technology works. Um, please feel free to, to contact any of our team, either directly or through the Talking Town Planning um, at wig.com um, email address. Um, and hopefully we'll hear from you all soon. And I hope this is really useful for you today. Thanks very much.